Testament to the book of Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we won't waste any time jumping right into this this evening. We're going to begin with reading one verse, verse number 20 in Acts 19. And um, we're coming to this verse because really it's the summary of the ministry that God has given us down in South Florida, beginning in Key West, throughout the Florida Keys and throughout South Florida, the 10 million people living there from around the world that God has gathered together in that place. But it's not just a summary of the ministry God has given us in South Florida. This one verse is actually a summary of all of God's work for all time. Because this one verse teaches us something. It teaches us that anyone can go anywhere at any time and see God do an amazing thing. See, soul saves, churches started, lives transformed, families building their lives on the Bible. Anyone from the first century to the 21st century, from Richmond Hill, Georgia to Key West, Florida. I've got a list here of all of the, uh, the missionaries here. They can go out to Brazil. They can go to South Africa. They can go to Haiti, the Philippines, Mexico, Kenya, Ghana, anywhere in the world and see the miraculous happen. Because of what we learn about the nature of God and His Word in this verse. Would you look at it with me? Acts 19 verse 20. The Bible says so simply in such few words. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. I'd like for you just to circle or underline the very last word in that verse. The word prevailed. This word has captured my attention. It's captured my heart and mind. When I first read this, I almost suspected that it would say something like this. So mightily grew the word of God and dominated and conquered. But that's not what it says. God is teaching us something about the nature of the struggle and the fight and the difficulty and the battle. How what took place in a city one day thousands of years ago was a great struggle a conflict, a showdown took place. But at the end of it all, God's word came out on top. Amen. And uh, we know that wherever the Bible is believed, wherever it is faithfully preached and taught and practiced and obeyed, then God's people have every reason to believe that his word will prevail. Amen. And I have a very simple message this evening. It's just one truth that I want to give, get across to you this evening. You can take all that you have learned about God's Word, that it's inspired, that it's preserved, that it's powerful and pure, and that it's profitable, that it's life-changing, and it's eternal. You can take all the things that you know about God's Word, and I just want to add one thing to that tonight. I want to remind you that God's Word also prevails. That word means triumphs. It overcomes. I guess I can say it like this. The Word of God wins. And in Acts 19, there's a great battle. I mean, there's a great showdown, a conflict. And here God just gives a simple summary. He said, I'll tell you what happened. In the end, the word of God won. That's what happened. And that's what happens everywhere the, word of, the work of God takes place across the world. I want to show you just a few things in this passage as we look at it together. If you would write this down, the first thing we find in Acts 19 is a city that is given to idolatry. A city that's given to idolatry. In verse number one, we're introduced to this city. Acts 19 and verse one, it says this. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to, what's the next word? Ephesus. So the city that is the setting for this great showdown in Acts 19 is the city of Ephesus. Would you say Ephesus with me? Ephesus. Ephesus. All right. It was Ephesus for this particular occasion. And there in the city of Ephesus, it was one of the famous cities of the Roman Empire. It was well known for many things, but perhaps the greatest is that there in Ephesus was a great temple that was constructed to a goddess named Diana, the goddess Diana. Historians tell us that the temple was 400 feet long, 200 foot wide, and it took 200 years to build. Imagine that. That's an, you guys just starting a building project. Imagine if you had to wait 200 years. That's a pretty big project, isn't it? And uh, people would come from all over the known world to gather here to come into this temple. 
All of the city life was wrapped up in it. The religion, the education, the commerce, all of the things were wrapped up in this temple in the city of Ephesus. God tells us a few more things about this city. In verse number two, he tells us the people there had never heard of God. I want you to think about that for a second. Would you look this way? We must never forget that on, in this world, in this moment, there are people who have never been taught about the true and the living God. Look what the Bible says about Ephesus in verse 2. The apostle Paul arrives and he's preaching the gospel. It says, he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? To us, that seems like a rather simple question. He says, has God come to live inside of you? Have you been saved and indwelt by the Holy Spirit? A rather simple question, we would think. But look what their response is. And they said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And here in this city of Ephesus, there were people who had never learned about the true and living God. And all across the world today, every week I meet boys and girls and teenagers and even adults coming in from foreign countries in South Florida who have never once heard the gospel, never once held a Bible. It's astonishing, but it's true. The Bible goes on to tell us some more things about this city. In verse 13, it introduces us to some of the characters living in Ephesus. Would you like to know about some of the people living there at that time? Look what the Bible says in verse 13. It says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, that just doesn't even sound good, does it? Vagabond Jews, he says. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. That's a pretty rough crowd. <laughs> That's probably not the place you're looking to move your Christian family to and settle down in the city of Ephesus. They got vagabond Jews, they got exorcists, and people running around filled with evil spirits. That's a rough group living in the city of Ephesus. God tells us something else. He tells us that they were given to curious arts and astrology. Look what it says in verse 19. Many of them also which use curious arts brought their books together. Essentially what that means is that they worship the stars. They thought that the stars that we look up at, the beautiful stars that God made, they thought they were gods. And as a matter of fact, many historians say that God, the goddess Diana herself was a meteorite that crashed and landed in that part of the earth. And they carved into this meteorite an image of a woman. And they said, look, God has come to earth. God has come to be with us. And the goddess Diana, many of them believe, was a meteorite who landed in that part of the world. And so they're given to superstition and to these different things. And then there's one last thing we learn about this city. There's one final thing, and it's the saddest thing of all. Would you look with me at verse 35? The Bible says in verse 35 about their worship. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus... What man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? So you know what that means? Just like you and I are gathered here tonight to worship the true and living God. Every day and every week, boys and girls and teenagers and young adults and families, they gather together too to worship their God. They gather to sing the songs and the orchestras played and, and the choir sang to Diana. And they taught their children to pray to Diana. And they taught their families about the false god Diana. When they needed help, they said, you turn to this big rock, this God who is no God, this God who could not help them, who could not save them. Now, I understand something to you. This sounds interesting, but it's not life changing until it's personal. Until you come to realize that there's Ephesus all around the world today. My Ephesus is the Florida Keys in South Florida. It's shocking the godlessness and the idolatry and the complete ignorance of the Bible. But I'd imagine I don't have to go very far from here to find the same thing. It's coming all over the world. This city filled with idolatry really is just a picture of what the world's becoming as we live in the last days. When I think of this city of Ephesus, I think of it as a place where the devil had come in and he had conquered it years before Paul ever arrived. It was like one of his strongholds. To me, when I read this, it seems like the devil was the undisputed champion of Ephesus. No one to oppose him. 
No one to give the opposite side and the true side. And so children turning into men and women and growing old and living and dying, never once hearing the truth. And there's Ephesus today all across the world. But I'm so grateful to tell you the story doesn't just end with the sad case. Oh, there's people who don't know the Lord. They live and they die. Praise God. God has a plan. God is doing something about it. The second thing we find in Acts chapter 19 is incredible. It's encouraging. It may make some of you want to stand up and rejoice. It's that God is advancing with a local church. A local church advancing by faith with the gospel. Look at the Bible says in verse number 2. It says that Paul arrived. One man arrived to Ephesus with the truth of the gospel. Oh, this is so encouraging. The Bible tells us that he's there and he's preaching. And then in verse number 7 it says, And all the men were about 12. Now I look at this building. I look at these facilities and my mouth starts to water. I think, wow. I get a little jealous. I have to pray, Lord, help me not to covet because of what we're in. But then I'm encouraged to be reminded in Ephesus, the Bible says it was a church that started. One man arrived with the truth of the gospel. He's preaching in the marketplace. He's preaching in the town. He's preaching house to house. And guess what happened in the dark place that was the stronghold of the devil in Ephesus? Guess what happened when a preacher arrived with the gospel? People got saved. People put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and God changed their life. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I'm so grateful for this. That for every Ephesus, God raises up and calls a Paul. And in here today, there are Pauls. There are people that God is working in your heart, young man, lady, elderly man. God doesn't care if you're alive. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. There are places in this world who are waiting. They're waiting for the gospel, their modern day Ephesus, and God raises up Paul's. I wonder if this week some of them will be identified. Wouldn't that be so encouraging? What a thrill and a glory that would be. But there's a church started in this dark place. A light is beginning to shine. Just 12 people gathering there. They go everywhere preaching the gospel. It gets exciting, by the way. In verse 8, it tells us they were kicked out of the synagogue. You know, not everyone gets happy about the truth. Not everyone is thrilled about new churches started. We had a lady come up after a baptism day a few weeks ago, and she said, I want you to know, Pastor, I'm praying for this church. I thought, well, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm praying that God would dismantle, that this church would be dismantled. This is the worst thing that ever happened for this island. You see, not everyone is thrilled when God is working, because it's sad to say there are enemies of the cross of Christ. There is a real devil who's also working in this battle. But thank God, this church in Ephesus is advancing by faith. God is doing amazing things. And look what it says in verse 10. It says, and this continued by the space of two years. It didn't happen overnight. They didn't just dump water on the ground and a great work just pop up. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of prayers. It takes a lot of faithfulness from men and women and boys and girls and young people just like yourself for something like this to happen. I know this didn't just pop up one day. No, 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 no. This has gone on for years right here. That's where the strength of this church is. God working over a period of time. Right. Well, two years pass, and look what the Bible says happened. This continued by the space of two years. So that, are you with me in verse 10? When I stop, I want you to say the next word. In verse 10, Acts 19. And this continued by the space of two years, so that... All. all. Now that's interesting. What does all mean? Well, all means all, doesn't it? Right. It says, so that all they which dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This is a mighty church. Yeah, just 12 people, but moving forward with the power of the omnipotent God, the power of the gospel, the power of the Bible, the power of the Holy Spirit, and everyone who lived not just in Ephesus, but any, everyone who lived anywhere near that place in the whole region, they didn't just hear about the name of Jesus. They heard about the Lord Jesus, Amen. God the Son, and what he came to earth to do. That's amazing. And the Bible tells us a re, uh, something of a revival began to happen. In verse 17 it says, And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified in a place where all they knew about was Diana. Diana, they sing to Diana, they pray to Diana. Now in this dark stronghold of the Roman Empire, they never even heard about God, the Holy Spirit. Now they're walking around magnifying the name of Jesus. Boy, that Jesus, he's something else. The power of Jesus, is in, he's changed my life. The Lord Jesus, he's so precious to me for what he's done to my family. 
That's happening in Ephesus. That's amazing, isn't it? Look what it says in the next verse, verse 18. It says, and many, and many that believed came. Remember, they started with how many? Twelve. Now the Bible says there's a lot of people getting saved. Now many are hearing. Now many are believing. And then they decided to have a bonfire. How many of you like bonfires? Where I grew up in the Florida Keys, you can't have much of a bonfire. <laughs> but I moved to Knoxville, and I seen some bonfires that almost looked like the sun they are burning. Just massive bodies of fire. Well, in the city of Ephesus, they had a bonfire. Now, usually, in bonfires, you burn wood. They burn books. Look what the Bible says in verse 19. And many of them, which also use curious arts, brought their books together... And burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. They took all the literature that had kept them bound in the lies, in the error, in things that could not save them and could not help them. They took all the things that had them wrapped up in false teachings and idolatry. And they said, we don't need this junk anymore. What should we do with it? Someone said, I know, let's burn it. And they threw all their books there, 50,000 pieces of silk. That must have been quite a sight. This wasn't something happening in the quarter of a city hidden. This became very public. This church was advancing by faith with the gospel. I guess it's no wonder in Matthew 16, 18, the Lord Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Isn't that amazing? Do you want to know what the most powerful thing in the world is? You know what the most powerful thing in Richmond Hill is? I'm standing in it. I'm here among it, shall I say. It's the people. It's this local New Testament church. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit. How many of you have the Holy Spirit living in you and with you? Would you raise your hand? Good grief. The power wrapped up in the gospel and in the Bible and in the dwelling of the Holy Spirit gathered together as God's army in this place. This is the most powerful thing in the world, a local New Testament church. And so you see on one side, I hope you see the stage being set. On one side, there's a city that is filled with idolatry. On the other side, there's a church moving forward by faith with the gospel. And then here's the third and the final thing. You find great conflict arose. Great conflict arose. I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 23. Look at, look at what it says in verse 23. The Bible says this, and the same time there arose no small stir about that way. At the same time, when God was doing his greatest work in the lives of young boys and girls and teenagers and families, when God was changing hearts and saving souls and transforming lives, at the same time, the devil had another group over here that he was stirring up to rise up and go oppose God's work. Isn't that something? At the same exact time. You know what that means? At the same time as this church is advancing, moving forward. I'm listening to the pastor talk. I'm thinking, man, he must have a lot of faith. He's talking to me about phase one and phase two and phase three and moving forward and seeing God reach Richmond Hill in this part. I'm thinking, wow. Well, you better know something. There are people, the world, the flesh, and the devil who aren't thrilled about it, who aren't happy about it. There are people who oppose the things of the God. It's not just, see, do we really think that the, that the devil's just going to lay down and play dead? Right. You think he's just going to give up the territory that he has? He won't fork over an inch. Right. You won't grow in your Christian life just by default. You've got to strain and press. That's where the struggle is for some of you. You're waiting for it to fall in your lap. Right. You've got to rise up and go by faith. Amen. Say, give it to me, God. My family, my community, this church. The devil's not thrilled about it and he's going to do something. In verse 24 through 27, he tells us he had a riot that broke out led by a man named Demetrius. Demetrius and a group of silversmiths. There were these little guys. There were these guys who made these little trinkets. They made little statues of Diana. And they became really wealthy selling them to all the people who lived in Ephesus. It was their goal to have a little statue of Diana on every coffee table, on every little child's nightstand. They wanted to get them out everywhere in the community. So why? So they can get rich. And the Bible says that Paul shows up preaching the gospel, and he says, These be no gods which are made by man's hands. 
And people are looking at these things saying, what are we doing with this? we got the true and living God. And sales plummeted. And the people were furious. And they went out and they started a riot. And I wish I can take the time to show you. It's unbelievable. I thought that riots was a new phenomenon. I thought it was just a 21st century crazy thing. It turns out people have been rioting for a long time. Some historians believe that up to 20,000 people on this day in Ephesus were in the streets rioting. And look what it says. Let me just show you a little bit of it. Verse 28. It says, And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city, it says, was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And the Bible tells us in verse 32, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. <laughs> They're telling, the Bible's telling us that there's 20,000 people gathered, and some of them over here yelling one thing, another group is over here yelling another thing, and most of the people that were there didn't even know why they were there. <laughs> they just found themselves and said, yeah, we're, yeah, we're against this, we, we don't want this, 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 and they're just yelling, and mob mentality takes over. Right. Can you imagine? This is, this is a great conflict. This is a showdown between the wealthy, influential people of the city marching through the streets. And I want to read you a verse that greatly convicts me. I want to read you a verse that greatly convicts me. Look at verse 34. The Bible says, But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Were they wrong? They were wrong. But were they committed? They were committed. Were they devoted? They were devoted. Were they willing to be inconvenienced? They were willing to be inconvenienced. For two, I've never seen such a display, have you? Have you ever seen 20,000 people walking through the street saying, Great is the goddess Diana! Great is the goddess Diana! Great is the goddess Diana! I read that and think about the passion of unbelievers and false religions. And it greatly convicts me because I have the truth and I just want to sit on it and I just want to coast with it for two hours yelling. They're saying, if they're going to take this city, it won't be without a fight. Great is the goddess Diana. Great is the goddess Diana. I wonder, where's your passion? Where's our commitment? Where's our devotion? But I'm so grateful for the conclusion. I guess it's no wonder the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8 when he's talking about coming back to Corinth, he said, I'm going to abide in Ephesus for a while. A great door is open unto me and effectual, and there are many adversaries. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me? I don't know all that this group of Christians face, but apparently they're being thrown in arenas with wild beasts for their faith and their work with the gospel, but they wouldn't quit. Right. They wouldn't stop. I guess that's why Paul said at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I think we forgot what we were enlisted in, right. a fight. This isn't easy. A church doesn't take over a city just, just without sacrifice, without faith and prayer and commitment. We're in an eternal battle. It's not me versus them. It's not you versus them. It's God versus the devil. It's the church of the living God versus Satan, the world, and the flesh. But praise the Lord. How did it all end? Would you like to know? Whatever became of that great showdown in Ephesus? Well, we come back to where we started. Look at verse 20. The Bible just simply says, God's summary. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. He said, I'll tell you what happened in Ephesus. The Bible won. The word of God won. And the people are saying, no one will ever give up Diana. The temple will never be threatened to be put out of business. But where is the temple of Diana today? Does anyone know? It's nothing but ruins. Does someone have a Bible in here? Do you have your Bible? Would you hold it up? I'm going to see. You got a Bible? I guess the word of God has prevailed, hasn't it? People are still learning the Bible, living the Bible, believing the Bible, preaching the Bible. You know what God is trying to teach us? The word of God prevails. And you look back at this and you say, whatever happened there? He said it prevailed. And my prayer 
is that time will pass and people will look at South Florida. They'll say, whatever happened down there? Can someone give us a tale of the tape? I mean, well, what, what happened down there? And people will say, I'll tell you what happened. A group of people went down there with a real powerful book and a real powerful God indwelling them and a real powerful message. And the word of God prevailed. Amen. And I'm guaranteeing that's the prayer of the missionaries going to Brazil, sure. to Africa, to Haiti, Mexico, all over. That there people will look back and say, what happened? Well, the word of God, it, it, was it easy? No, it was a fight. It was a battle. It was a struggle. It wasn't a first round knockout. It was a 12 round heavyweight knockdown drag out fight. But when the last bell was rung, when all the smoke cleared, they came out and said, I'll tell you what, the Bible won. Amen. Isn't that encouraging to know? Amen. Are you siding with the Bible? Then you're on the winning side. Amen. This is an encouraging message, but I know it's not life changing. I know it won't change anyone here's life until it becomes personal. Until you see your difficulties. No, 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 no. Until you see your family, your young people, the young people in these schools here, and you recognize what they need, God has already given to us. We don't have to go on a great search. We already have it in the mighty, prevailing Word of God. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your Word. It is so powerful and convicting. I know that there are ones here today who are struggling, dear God. They're struggling in their own personal life. They're struggling in their family. They're struggling in their service for you. I pray that you'd bring us all back to a simple, renewed faith in your word. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.